I don't want no oil a spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things a creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No nukes! Morning, Toledo, and good morning, Bowling Green, and hello out there to Columbus, Ohio, and to everyone listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and I'm here with my enthusiastic co-host, Rebecca Wood. Yes, <laughs> and together, Rebecca and I are going to be crafting you an hour of amazing radio called For a Green Future. Joe Herbert. likes to do me a favor and start with the facts that I know to start the, start the show, like my name. Yeah, <laughs> name, right. If name I can get that show. right, there's hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we like to ease into things. Right. Here. It's yeah. Sunday morning, you yeah. know, a lot of people are just getting up. Um, great. And so the name of the show is For a Green Future. And so for the next hour, we'll be talking about ecology and the environment. And we'll be talking about them in the ways that they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness the wealth and health and happiness of your friends and your family and the birds and the bees and the cats and the dogs and the squirrels and the hawks and pretty much everybody and everything because, like it or not, we're all wrapped up together on this wonderful tiny little planet called Earth. And we have a wonderful show lined up for you today, as usual. We are just going to chat for the next 10 minutes or so, and then uh, we have, and then we'll hear well, then we have an interview with our, our good friend of the show, Stephanie C. And uh, we've just had a big development on a story we've been following for more than a year now. The uh, Yellowstone National Park just came out with its uh, revised bison management plan. It, it's been working on it for over a year. And uh, so they made the final decision, and we'll, we'll check in with Stephanie to see what they decided and what that means for the last wild herd of bison in the United States. Then it's our advertisers and patrons. And then Rebecca, what will you be talking about this week? I am going to talk about pecans. Pecans, all right. It's tasty. Or pecans, as the, uh, as the National Pecan Association wants us to say it. Oh, okay, so that's the official pronunciation. National right. Pe Pecan Growers, So you, yeah. you can say pecan, but, you sh but it, they prefer pecan. Okay. Got it. Uh, then, for the uh, that's ecological news, and we have a, a number of very interesting environmental stories. And hopefully, at some point during the show, we'll talk to you at 877-909-1007. That's 877-909-1007 to call in. And this is a call-in show, and we we cherish our calls because that's why we do this show live every Sunday in order to make it possible for you folks to weigh in on any sort of environmental issue that you're that, that you want to talk about. So so <laughs> so the question I wanted to start this show was was uh, was this last week was it hot enough for you as they say. It was, about, it was hot enough for me definitely. Yeah yeah it was uh, we were caught in a part of a heat wave that covered most of the Midwest uh, and the south, southwest, and the the southeast, <laughs> basically a whole bunch of North America, you know, all the way down into Mexico. They had a tremendous heat wave down there, 
Um, and we're going to talk more about that heat wave. Actually, it was uh, all over the globe. This was one of the hottest weeks ever in uh, almost almost every continent on the planet. So uh, it's part of uh, <laughs> part of what's going on, on on the whole planet, which is that the heat waves, the heat, the global warming is causing more global warming, uh, and it's accelerating. And because it's creating a positive feedback. New positive feedback. <laughs> yes. yes. So we'll talk more about that in the ecological news portion. But I, I wanted to just point out to everybody <laughs> that uh, heat actually makes us stupider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, noticed this. It's not your imagination, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you're hot and you just can't, like, figure out the next thing to do. It's actually not all your fault because there's a lot of research that shows uh, when we are in temperatures higher than 79 degrees, that actually lowers the oxygen levels in your blood. And they found, looking at things like standardized test scores, you know, if you're a high school kid taking your SAT and it happens to be 80 degrees where you are, statistically there's a, a measurable difference in performance from people who take their SATs in cool rooms as opposed to rooms that are over 79 degrees. Uh, as much as 10 to 15 percent oh, wow. difference right and it's you know not a question of studying <laughs> it's a question of uh you know heat makes us stupid uh part of the explanation is lower oxygen that levels another part is dehydration dehydration also affects cognitive abilities and so there's a real danger when it's hot like this that we're going to make bad decisions <laughs> that we're going to get kind of uh, desperate, especially when we're starting to talk about, finally we're starting to talk about global warming in a serious way. Unfortunately, the, com the combination of the temperatures going up so dramatically and the increasing stupidity can kind of push decision makers into sort of desperation where they make even worse decisions. Mm. And uh, that actually happened this past week when they, the Congress passed what's called the Advance Act, which is a, it's basically a, a, a nukesters, you know, a, a nuclear power zealots uh, dream legislation. It, it does amazingly bad things. Like it, it changes the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It literally changes them from regulating nuclear power to promoting nuclear power, which is, exactly the mistake that the old Atomic Energy Commission used to make, and that's why they abolished the Atomic Energy Commission and created the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, because they had, you know, all kinds of plant breakdowns and meltdowns, and, you know, Three Mile Island is just the most famous, but they had, you know, Fermi 1, and they had a whole bunch of other nukes that basically crashed and burned because the regular, quote-unquote, advancement, you know, the promotion agency was the regulation agency, and it's hard to promote something when you know it's like they're like breaking the rules and, and uh, bucking safety. And it also, another bad thing the Advance Act does is it allows for foreign ownership of nuclear plants. Oh, lovely. So, yeah, remember that old, the whole, the lie they were telling back, you know, it, when we were trying to get House Bill 6 blocked, and they said we were trying to give the grid to China. Well, they literally just passed a law that allows China to buy our nuclear power plants. Alrighty then. <laughs> and it also provi provides billions of dollars more, tens of billions of dollars more for bailouts of unprofitable nuclear plants and, you know, like Davis Bessie and Perry. Uh, it also funds the creation of more halo, halo fuel, high assay, low enriched uranium. In other words, fuel that can be turned into nuclear bombs very easily uh, because that's what Bill Gates needs for his sodium reactor, for his uh, Terra Power reactor. He needs the bomb fuel because, uh, you know, that's the good stuff. Um, and so we're giving it to him. Well, you're using our tax dollars to give it to him. And it also, this is, comes on the heels of the Congress failing to renew what was called the, the RECA Act, which is the Radiation um, Compensation Act, which was a, a bill that gave just a little bit of money, just a few thousand dollars to people who 
have been directly impacted by the uranium fuel cycle, by people who live near reprocessing plants that get exposed to radiation and develop cancer and have miscarriages and, and uh, have other health problems because of this radiation that was created by the nuclear industry over the last 75 years. Some of them used to be able to get some money from the federal government as kind of a, a recognition that, okay, yeah, we did do this to you. We have kind of responsibility to you. But uh, Congress now has decided that even though, yes, we've done it to you, even though you know, we created this radiation that's killing your family, we no longer have to give you any kind of compensation for it. And sadly, uh, this bill, it's passed both the House and the Senate. Uh, the Senate vote was this past week, and it passed 88 to 2, which is a very interesting uh, number. Uh, there are a lot, the, the Dukesters have made a whole bunch of hay on, you know, talking about how wonderful that this is such a bipartisan bill because both Democrats and Republicans voted for it. But 10 senators didn't vote at all. Only two voted against it. Uh, one was Bernie Sanders and uh, the other was, um, oops, his name just went out of my head. But he's a, a senator that is, has been uh, very regularly, we've been able to count on him to be opposed nuclear power for his whole career. But I, I have to remind everybody that when Congress makes like the biggest mistakes, you know, the worst decisions, usually it is bipartisan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. And the, yeah, the one that comes to mind, you know, of course, the biggest one in the recent years is the Iraq war. Yeah, that was bipartisan. Mm -hmm. Both Democrats and Republicans got up there and said, let's go into Iraq. It took the cost of, you know, tens of thousands of American lives. Estimates are a million Iraqi lives. And all we did really was sec secure Iraq's oil fields for our oil companies, which, you know, still control them which is, uh, you know, partly why we're back, going back to the first point, it's been so dang hot because uh, all over the world, as we said, that the effects of global warming are becoming really, really apparent. As the great Henry Rollins said, die for oil, sucker. Yeah. So uh, speaking of bad decisions, the Yellowstone National Park just made a bad decision that we're gonna talk about now with our, in our interview with Stephanie C. And uh, I think let's just go ahead and head right to that interview. Well, hello, and welcome back to For a Green Future. Hi. Hi. So much. Could you uh, tell our audience your name and who you're with? My name's Stephanie C. I'm the co-founder of Rome Free Nation. We're a Montana-based um, advocacy group with a major focus on the wild buffalo of Yellowstone National Park and, um, and wild nature in general. Mm -hmm. And we just became an official 501c3, which is very exciting. Ah, yes, congratulations on that. Took a long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. The reason I'm asked to interview you today is because there's been a, a big development. Um, it was a topic the last time we had you on, we were talking about how Yellowstone was reviewing and has made pro proposed possible changes to its bison management plan. Um, so what what just happened? Well, it's a totally, this is completely specific to Yellowstone National Park. It has nothing to do with the interagency bison management plan, which is a state federal tribal plan. Um, they just released their final environmental impact statement. And unfortunately, all the, the bison advocates, the real bison advocates were pushing for alternative three, which would have put into place natural selection, dispersal on the landscape and into capture for slaughter, but they chose alternative two. They completely caved, chose alternative two, which is pretty much business as usual, usual, but they're also putting an emphasis on quarantine. The greenwash name for that is their bison uh, transfer conservation plan, which is essentially a domestication program and serves nothing but the human. And they also place a large emphasis on excessive hunting which is not really hunting um, outside of Yellowstone's boundaries and capture for slaughter remains in place. So we were really disappointed that, you know, they could have made some big change and really, you know, ended the status quo, but instead we're, you know, we're stuck in the same spinning circle of death. 
where the buffalo are anyway. So if you read what they wrote about this uh, decision, which I guess they they published it on the June 7th. And so now we're in a 30 day waiting period, yep. um, which I guess doesn't really um, need anything, right? I mean, it's nothing can happen in this 30 days. It's yeah, just... There's nothing for the public to do at this point with this waiting period, but the record of decision will be issued at the beginning of July. Right. So in their description of what they've decided, you know, they had three alternatives um, and they listed alternative one. They said that was business as usual, right? Just maintaining the status quo. They chose alternative two, which they claim is more tolerant of, of bison. Well, I mean, it does, the population um, cap is higher than it is within the interagency bison management plan. Um, it's 6,000. But if you're going to say, okay, let's have 6,000 buffalo, we're just going to use hunting to, to try to control the population and do more of this capture for quarantine, it doesn't serve the buffalo at all. You know, mm -hmm. it's just serving the humans. It's serving these hunters and it's serving people who want to put them behind fences. Yeah, I, I, I think that's an important point to, to focus on is that it puts a cap on the number of bison. I said, yeah. you know, well, we all the alternatives would have, mm -hmm. but the alternative three was the highest. Um, mm -hmm. And it, like I said, it would have pretty much ended capture for slaughter, but not, nothing really changes. I mean, they're just going to increase the number of buffalo who could get killed at BD Gulch or you know, on a horse butte. They're going to increase the number of buffalo who get captured and rounded up and separated from their families and shipped to various places. Um, you know, so it's yeah, really it, it really did seem like every other sentence was they were encouraging more tribal hunting. Yep. That they just really want to do that. And um and it's interesting because the last winter when we had that brutal, brutal winter, even Yellowstone called it a slaughter. Mm -hmm. But now they're encouraging even more. It doesn't there's no they don't serve the buffalo. They're not serving the buffalo at all. Mm -hmm. But alternative three would have, they would have considered the Buffalo's perspective, which would have been monumental, but instead more of the same. I know there was a lot of hope that they might change the, basically the fundamental philosophy behind their management plan there and choose alternative three. Uh, I guess there were like 27,000 comments. Um, do we have any idea like, where those came down it, it seemed like when they were describing the con comments there were more comments saying be let the bison grow and develop naturally um is that yes you, that's true there, from what i have heard through other colleagues um chris jeremiah reported and he's the park bison biologist that three quarters of the comments were for alternative three hmm. wow and yeah. then you went with alternative two anyway. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. So um so what happens what happens now? It's a Go good ahead. question. I think I think the next step, if it is taken, would be litigation, but that all remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. And so this is also separate from the consideration of the Yellowstone bison as an endangered species, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, how where is that process right now? They're still, they're still doing their study. Um, we're not going to know here a decision until uh, 2026. 2026. Mm -hmm. A long time. Right. And you, you referred to the, um, you know, the, the huge slaughter of, a, you know, the previous winter, there were about a third of the herd was, was destroyed. Um, we can't have too many more winters like that, can we? I mean, if, if you have, you know, if you're taking out a third of the herd each winter, it's pretty soon you're going to run out of bison. You're not only going to run out of bison, you're going to change their behavior. You're, you're, you're cha I mean, these hunts, so-called hunts, you know, when you're gunning entire family groups down at the park boundary, that's like going to a family reunion and, and wiping the whole clan out, you know, and you're, you're negatively impacting migratory memory. You know, the buffalo who are 
choosing to migrate, who need to migrate, who follow those instincts are the ones being killed. And they're the ones who are teaching others. And if they're gone, who's left to teach? So, I mean, and it's like, you hear the same thing. It's like a lot of these hunters, especially the tribal hunters will say, oh, we want more buffalo on a larger landscape. And it's like, well, then you're going to have to change your behavior because your very behavior is preventing exactly that. I mean, if you're killing every buffalo that walks out of the park, they're never going to get anywhere unless right. you load them up onto trucks and ship them around. And that's not, that's not wild. That's not the way buffalo want to live. And when they're shipping, uh, well, you know, the, they say in here that so far they've shipped about 400 bison to uh, native tribes, um, but they've, but there have been thousands slaughtered, right? I mean, the, the, the number being hunted and killed is just disproportionate to the number that they're doing this. Uh, thousands and thousands via capture for slaughter and the so-called hunt. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's a drop in the bucket, the number of buffalo that are making it out of the park alive, even though they're getting out on trucks. Um, and, you know, a lot of those buffalo that go through the quarantine process end up being slaughtered anyway. Mm. You know, and not everyone survives. Because... And that's a, that's a false narrative that they try to, you know, they really try to say, oh, this is just an alternative to slaughter. And it's not. There's a lot of buffalo that continue to get slaughtered going through the, the quarantine program. Because they test positive for brucellosis. They end up testing positive. And the thing is, the whole brucellosis thing, when they test positive, when you're doing blood tests, you're only able to detect antibodies, not actual mm -hmm. infection. So when they're doing these blood tests and they say, oh, they're testing positive, those are buffalo that have resistance to brucellosis. And they're killing mm -hmm. them. You know, brucellosis is very much like you can liken it to chicken pox. You get it, you develop the antibodies, you don't get it again, and you can't give it to anyone else. Once it's done, mm -hmm. it's done. the smartest thing would be to let it run through the herds and just let nature take its course. I mean, the buffalo mm -hmm. and elk, they build resistance to it. But and of course, you know, nothing happens to the elk who have been implicated so, you know, over 25 times for transmitting brucellosis to cattle. And nothing's happening to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that was also kind of struck me in in reading because they describe alternative three as treating the bison more like elk, um, and then they just uh, reject it. So well, they I think I think people because we were talking about this. So some people know that um, we have a terrible governor here in Montana right now, Governor uh, Gianforte. I there's another. <laughs> I call him I am glad I didn't just say but um he threatened when this process first began alternative three was 10,000 buffalo and so we were really excited and that was during the scoping phase the very beginning phase and governor Gianforte <laughs> threatened to sue Yellowstone if they didn't drop the population down to 3,000 so Yellowstone kind of compromised they definitely caved in a big way um but, you know, they, they cave to the governor of Montana who, you know, let him sue, let him do it again. The public, the information, the science, the new, you know, new information that we have, Montana would not win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess one, maybe uh, you could tell me that seemed like a positive note about alternative two was that they set a minimum of, I believe it's 5,500 at the start of the winter season. For the so, okay after calving so oh well that's the maximum after calving right, right. but I, i'm talking about uh the pre-winter population i saw uh, maybe i misinterpreted i saw a line that they are saying they want at least i think it was 5200 as the the minimum before winter hits so yeah well what i saw that it was three thousand to six thousand so three thousand oh low end yeah. and that's what montana wants right gotcha. that's the politically driven derived number it has nothing to do with ecology or science or anything it's mm -hmm. just a political trap. just kind of what the ranchers picked huh so all right well uh, i i do need to ask you i guess about the um there's been a lot of buzz on social media 
about the the white buffalo calf that was born? Yeah, we heard about it that first day. Um, I got in touch with the photographer. She's pretty much the only one who has seen this calf. Mm. You know, we're we're hopeful that this calf is out there, but um, so far she's staying pretty hidden. Her mom's keeping her hidden, or who knows what happened. But um, you know, the the it brings a lot of hope. And as Chief Arvel Looking Horse, who's the nineteenth uh, carrier of the Buffalo calf pipe, he he's like. I hate to compare him to the Pope, but he's like the Pope of the Lakota nation. Uh, he said, you know, this is, this is a blessing and a warning. We need to change the way we're doing things. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, hopefully other people will get a glimpse of this calf. Hopefully if she does migrate with her family into Montana during the hunt, that hunters will refrain from killing her. You know, who knows what's going to happen, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. should, huh? And her family, too. I mean, if you just leave the one calf, you know, isolated without anyone, you know, without any of the, the herd to care for her, she, you know, won't do well. Yeah, and that happens a lot. But luckily, Buffalo will adopt. Mm. You'll see during the hunt, it's interesting because Buffalo do adopt. But mm. during the hunt, you'll often see a single adult female with like seven or eight yearlings. Mm. And it's like all those yearlings moms have been killed. Hmm. And then in the spring during calving season, you'll see solitary adult females who don't aren't pregnant, but they have all their, these other little yearlings, they're babysitting for the moms who are pregnant so that uh -huh. they can kind of be left. And then you'll see little satellite groups of pregnant moms who kind of hang around together and give birth close to the same time. But anyway, luckily Buffalo adopt. So if something happens to that white calf's family, hopefully there'll be others who take her in, but it's still difficult. It's difficult anyway. All right. Well, well, thank you, Stephanie. First, you want to add, is there anything you'd like to add? And second, if you could just remind people how they can find out about your organization. Yeah. Um, I can't think of anything else to add at the moment, but, uh, you can find out about Rome Free Nation on the web is RomeFreeNation.org. We're also on Facebook, Rome Free Nation, and we're also on uh, Instagram. And we do have an email list, and you can find our email address on our website and uh, shoot us an email, and we'll add you to it and, and keep you updated. All right, and uh, we will of course continue to keep in touch, and you know, <laughs> let us know if anything uh, if there's any developments we should let our audience know about. So you bet. Thank you so much. All right. And thank you for listening to that interview with Stephanie, whose, uh, whose love of the bison is always like inspirational. You know, she just is so devoted to protecting those, the largest mammal in North America. So let's uh, hope she succeeds. Okay. Uh, now it's time to hear from our advertisers and patrons. For a Green Future is also brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They also restore wildlife habitats and lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There are several ways to get a hold of them and find out what's happening. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. Another is to visit their website, www.wcparks.org. The website, again, is at www.wcparks.org. They are also available on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and many others. Just search for WC Parks. That's the Wood County Park District, and we're very grateful for their support. Yes, and we are also grateful for the support of our patrons. And our patrons are wonderful people who've gone to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. There they searched for For a Green Future, up popped our Patreon page, and they chose a level of membership that matches their monthly budget. And every month now, a little bit comes out of their account, comes over to us, 
and that's how we can afford to keep this show on the air. And uh, won't you join them? Okay, Rebecca, now it's time to talk pecans. Alrighty. Well, tomorrow is National Praline Day. Okay. I know we're all very excited, and uh, one of the popular nuts to put in pralines and or ingredients apparently is pecans. So, yeah, the, the pecan is a smooth brown nut with an, an edible kernel. It's a species of hickory that's no, native to um, the southwestern western U.S. and Mexico. Uh, so it's really, it's more, considerably more American than apple pie. Apples being from China, <laughs> originally. <laughs> um, it's, it's cultivated mostly in Georgia, New Mexico, Texas, and Mexico, parts of Mexico. Uh, let's see, the scientific name is Caria Illinoisensis. <laughs> looks, they tried to make a, a Latin thing out of Illinois. Uh, anyway, it's, it's uh, popular for use in cookies, obviously. Candies, pies, uh, it's used for the wood, and uh, pecan milk is... is uh, getting to be popular. It's got to make a fair amount of uh, protein compared to oat milk doesn't have very much protein. I looked at the bottle. Mm. Soy milk is, is, is better, but yeah. Pecan so milk. yeah. Okay. Yeah, soy milk, I don't know, it's been with the cancer or something, so. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Yeah. yeah. Pecan milk is much more expensive, unfortunately, but <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, if you can afford it, it's good. Um, it's the state nut, the pecan is the state nut of Alabama, Arkansas, California, Texas, and Louisiana, and also the state tree of Texas. Uh, pecan is from the Algon Algonquian word. You, it's, there's a difference between Algonquian, Algonquinian. This is Algonquian, I'm fairly sure. Okay. Like, Algonquinian is the larger language family, I think. Okay. El yeah, so... I've run up against this before. It's always confusing. But yeah, it's it's a word that's used for pecan nuts and also walnuts and hickory. So it just kind of means nut in Algonquian. Um, but yeah, the National Pecan Growers has requested in 1927 that we say it pecan, which I'm not sure I can, but I'll try. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, sorry. It's a deciduous tree. Uh, technically, it's a droop. It's a droop fruit. Like yeah, but, uh, peaches and plums, I think, are droops. Yeah. So it's got sort of like a fleshy thing around it. Only we eat the pit, I think. Weird. Anyway, huh. some ecological problems associated with pecans would be um, they get a lot of diseases and pests. Um, so that makes them vulnerable to climate change, which tends to put diseases and pests and funguses and whatnot on steroids, unfortunately. Aphids, they have big problems with aphids. Uh, so, but still, um, it looked as if they're not like the worst nut or nut tree for, for pesticide use. They're kind of in the middle towards the bottom even. Some of this was propaganda from the pecan industry, but you know, I saw this kind of confirmed other places at least, so. Probably true. Uh, so yeah, um, not a lot of ecological problems associated with it, except for it does, uh, it, there's some overcropping that goes on that can just deplete nutrients from the soil apparently. So that's not good. Uh, they like to grow wild around tree banks a lot. So that's how they have survived in Texas, even like in scary five year droughts and stuff. That's where they naturally grow. So yeah, they generally don't require irrigation unless they're being grown in arid climate. Uh, however, parts of Texas and Mexico are for fairly arid climate, so I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, it kind of depends mm -hmm. on where people are growing them. Uh, they don't require a lot of gas to transport because they're you know kind of centrally grown, which is kind of a plus. And uh, obviously, like most trees, they can sequester carbon, so they're good that way, and they provide habitats to animal, birds, microbes, and also food, obviously. Uh, different critters eat them because they're good to eat. So that's pecan trees. Yeah, I, I enjoy eating them. Yes. But now now you've got me wondering if that, because it's, uh, you know, it's obvious from the appearance of a pecan that's like, that's like the kernel on the inside. Right. But now I'm wondering, what can we eat the fruit on the outside? And if so, what does that taste like? 
I don't think so. No? <laughs> but okay. <laughs> maybe. I, I'd do more research before I try it. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of just, you know, being your own subject. Maybe if it, we've got a listener from the South who could yeah. call in yeah, and uh, let us know if they've ever eaten pecan fruit as opposed to pecan nut. Right. So, all right. Oh, we have a caller. Well, let's, uh, hello, caller. You're on the air. So here we got a, a great call. Hello. I'm a gentleman who Hi. had worked on ranches out in Colorado on a 19,000 acre ranch for many years. And what he described to us was uh, yeah. the buffalo swales, which are uh, big depressions in the ground that were created when buffalo used to roll around in the dirt to, in the sand to get you know, parasites off and to basically take dust baths and um, it's a of course it's a feature which is disappearing from the plains right now because the buffalo are gone but it was a great call and I'm sorry we didn't have the recording but back to the show yeah yeah, no, I, I, it makes perfect sense to me. And I, I, I've heard the term buffalo waller before, but. There's a thing in, I think, the Little House books where, uh, I don't know, one of the girls likes to pretend that they're fairy holes or something, but they're really from buffalo. Yeah, and and as you say, when there were millions and, and these things weigh, you know, some of them can weigh thousands of pounds, the, 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 the big old males, uh, it would make sense that they could uh, change, actually change the landscape like that. And it, it, this, it just brings home the, the fact that we actually have never, you know, no living person has seen the West the way it's quote unquote supposed to be. That is a West with bison in it that changes the whole ecology. It's, you know, that, that West, the, the West that we should be seeing and we would be seeing in a green future is a much wetter west you know it's less dry it's more fertile it has more biodiversity because there's bison there providing that you know they're a keystone species and so uh, yeah buffalo wallers sounds like we're a, a key part of that diversity so that's yeah that's cool thanks thanks for that call Nineteen thousand acres that must have been quite an experience living on that Oh, we go away. I guess we no longer have him. Okay. okay. So, all right. Well, thanks so much for that call. Yeah. And uh, anyone else is welcome to call in at 877-909. I, I heard about that a long time ago, but I'd forgotten. Buffalo wallers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sure, you can't have animals that large without changing the landscape, right? Yep. And they, yep. they changed it in positive ways that we are no longer getting the benefit of because they're trapped on it one little spot in Yellowstone and, yeah. and being managed like cattle yep. down to a number, you know, the, the arbitrarily chosen number of 6,000 when there should be millions, literally yep. millions. Yep. Okay, well, on to ecological news. And uh, the first uh, thing we're gonna cover, there's been a whole bunch of developments in the recent days on this topic of geoengineering which is the idea that, uh, you know, just give the engineers a, a shot at it and they can just solve the global warming problem by blocking the sunlight coming into the earth to prevent it from heating up. And of course, as we've covered before, geoengineering is doomed to failure because the problem is not too much sunlight coming in. The problem is actually not enough heat radiating back out again. Mm. And so blocking sunlight will only get you so far. But uh, it turns out there is a story in uh, Ecology and Environment News, e, e News, on their climate wire. This was back on uh, June 12th, titled EDF Tight-Lipped About New Geoengineering Research Program. And EDF here refers to the Environmental Defense Fund, which is one of the, the largest environmental organizations mon money-wise. And apparently they held a, a secret meeting with some of their biggest donors, uh, some scientists and some quote environmentalists, unquote. Uh, and they met with something called the LAD Climate Fund, talking about studying the possibility of geoengineering. And they are not telling anybody what they talked about or who was in the meeting. 
Uh, but there's a tendency for big, the biggest donors to be, you know, billionaires and billionaires who have uh, a vested interest in maintaining the current situation because that's how they made their millions and billions. And that's really the fundamental flaw in geoengineering is that it all gives cover to the current fossil fuel industry with the idea that, oh, we could just keep drilling and burning oil and coal. We just need to engineer the planet so that it, it doesn't hurt it. Um, but there was a related story in The Guardian on uh, June 21st, title of that story, Climate Engineering of U.S. Coast Could Increase Heat Waves in Europe, study finds. And basically, this study was prompted by the, the wildcat attempt at geoengineering that we talked about, we've talked about a couple times, where uh, they just started spraying salt up into the clouds to make it brighter. And they were, did this at, on, on an aircraft carrier museum off the coast near Sacramento. And uh, what these uh, people did, and they reported their results in Nature Climate Change on 621, and the title of that one is Diminished Effic Efficacy of Regional Marine Cloud Brightening in a Warmer World, <laughs> which to translate that, basically they found that if you start spraying the clouds up in California, uh, you can lower the temperature locally from like 10 to almost 50%, depending. But what that does is it ends up increasing the temperatures downwind in places like New York and Europe and the Atlantic. <laughs> and the, it, it seems to be that the reason for this is that you, the, the ocean currents are run by sunlight. So the Makes sun sense. shining on the ocean is what creates the temperature differences between you know, the northern ocean and the southern ocean. And that's what generates the, the currents that, that uh, carry temperatures around the world and try to tend to try to even Earth's temperatures out. So if you block the sunlight, you slow down the currents. And so if you slow down the currents, you slow down wind, and now you've got all this just stagnant air sitting, you know, not getting moved around, and that creates more high pressure systems that just sit there in heat domes. Somehow all this reminds me a lot of the 80s when, you know, Reagan and his pals would solution to there being way too many warheads uh, enough to exterminate humanity a dozen times over and they were like I know we're gonna build you a giant umbrella oh yeah <laughs> right that? Star Wars right? <laughs> yeah. the Star Wars defense right the, yeah so that was the last time people were trying to build giant umbrellas <laughs> right to just engineer your, your way out of a problem that engineering created yeah yeah so and it's still creating. Um, that is still creating. And so, as we've said, the, base, the basic situation is that all of these geoengineering things are doomed to fail. But the problem is, if we try them, and you know, going back to our theme for the day, is that this heating is driving, driving people to desperation and stupidity. So if we try them, <laughs> you know, there's no going back. Like once, uh -oh. you, once you put a whole bunch of chemicals up in the upper atmosphere to cool it down, and you discover, oh, that kills the, the you know, this <laughs> bacteria, which is essential for cloud creation. Right. And oh, now we don't have any more clouds, uh -oh. so <laughs> now we have even more heating. Yeah. You know, once you make mistakes like that, you can't go back and undo them because there's no way to like clean the upper atmosphere. So, so uh, let's hope EDF comes to its its senses and uh, doesn't start spending donation money on geoengineering schemes. Okay, and uh, speaking of EDFs, on the other side of the ocean, there's another EDF, uh, Electricité de France, which is uh, oh France's uh, one electric utility that covers the whole country. It's a... I, I got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Is, uh, is, is, the Occitan and Catalan languages; these are these are separate languages, are they, or are they dialects of French? Oh, if you ask them, they say they're separate languages. Okay, like Catalan. They yeah. sound an awful lot like Spanish is the thing. They don't mm -hmm. sound like they sound like some sort of weird uh, melding of the two, actually. Yeah. To me. So. 
So if you ask if you ask the speakers that they would insist it's separate. So that's I, I'll go with the native speakers. But anyway, over there in France, as uh, we've talked about many times on this show, the nuclear industry turns out to be quite corrupt, and there is a trial going on right now because a, a fella named Henri Polio, who ran the EDF from 2009 to 2014, uh, there's a story in uh, Liberation. I said it with a French accent because it actually is a French language paper right. on April 9th. Um, and uh, basically, there's been favoritism awarding contracts without bids. So this guy, Henri, allegedly uh, just gave, you know, contracts worth millions and millions of dollars to the people he liked and didn't go through the actual okay. process that you're supposed to go through, which is you put out a bid and you pick the most qualified and cheapest, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Bloomberg covered this back on May 21st with a, a story because uh, the title of that story is EDF warns of huge contract losses if convicted in Paris criminal trial. <laughs> because it turns out some European countries actually have laws that say you can't do business with corporations that have been convicted of felonies. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> Imagine yeah, that. Yeah. You know? That's, that's crazy talk. <laughs> I mean, if we tried something like that in the U.S., you know. They'd our, all have to go out of business. Our economy would collapse, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Punishing lawbreakers? What? what? No. Yeah, so uh, apparently there's a uh, contract talks for the EDF to build nukes in the Czech Republic and the U.K., and if they lose this case, which it looks pretty much like they're going to lose because it, it looks pretty, you know, it looks pretty bad for EDF, uh, then laws in those two countries will cancel the nuclear plant projects, which would be a huge victory for the environmentalists. But uh, <laughs> so we're going to keep an eye on that. Just something interesting. A little, they do things a little differently over there in Europe. They've got these, you know, these pesky ethics that they keep putting into their laws. Yeah. I don't know how they come up with that. All right, next this next story, uh, June 12th of this year, a uh, story in Truth Out, and that title of the story is Environmentalist Slam FERC Decision to Greenlight Mountain Valley Pipeline. And uh, this is a 303 mile long pipeline. It goes from West Virginia to Southern Virginia. And uh, environmentalists have been fighting it for years but the construction has gone on ahead even as they battled it. And finally, FERC uh, on uh, June 10th sent a letter to the company that had built this pipeline, uh, a company called, uh, well, I'll, get, I'll find that, but they sent a letter saying, okay, go ahead, you can build it, it's all right, uh, which upsets the environmentalists because this company has been getting violation after violation in terms of their construction and environmental damage and destroying wetlands and causing erosion. In fact, they had uh, 29 violations just so far this year, and they've had hundreds of violations over the course of the whole thing. And But Congress inserted into a debt ceiling bill last year uh, that FERC just has to approve it, you know, <laughs> has to ignore its regulations and just approve it. Um, and uh, so what has happened one interesting thing that also just happened is they tested a section of the pipeline by putting gas in it and it exploded. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. And so, Whoops. like, le literally a week after they exploded part of the pipeline, the FERC said, okay, go ahead and build it. Or go ahead and start. Oh dear Lord. Go ahead and start putting gas through it. They oh, pretty much built God. it. Um, and of course, another reason the environmentalists oppose it is because these kind of pipelines routinely put tons of methane into the air. Mm -hmm. uh, methane's much more of a potent greenhouse gas than CO2, and uh, the, just in normal operation, it's going to equal dozens of new coal plants uh, to just pump this methane around. So it was interesting, they approved it on uh, June 10th, and then a related story on June 13th, the Senate approved Biden's, uh, he put in three new FERC board of director positions. So I don't know if his FERC people are going to be a little more concerned about the environment or less concerned. Uh, we have to wait and see, but um, yeah, it's not good. 
Okay, so, <laughs> to, but to counter that with some good news, uh, we've been talking a lot about the, the criminal corporation Holtec, Holtec International. Uh, in fact, that's what last week's guest was. Uh, we were talking all about that with Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear last week. And what happened this week is one of the people who sits on the board of advisors for <laughs> Holtec got indicted on corruption. Whoopsie doodle. Yeah, a whole bunch of uh, corruption charges, uh, mostly st stemming from a tax development scheme where he uh, allegedly misdirected development funds to his corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is George Norcross, and it was interesting because he was scrubbed from the whole Tech International's website, like, immediately. <laughs> like, within hours of these uh, indictments coming down. But if you use the what's called the Wayback Machine, you can still, you can see what was there. And whole Tech was just glowing and saying, oh, we're so lucky to have this guy telling us what to do. And it turns out this guy allegedly is quite, quite corrupt. And uh, included in the the charges are that he uses he used threats and intimidation and political corruption to, to create this huge tax de tax development fraud uh, in order to build on some land that he had um, and uh, lower brownfield st standards so that you know you could build on contaminated soil without having to clean it up and uh, this just adds to the pile of evidence that suggests that perhaps Holtec is not a trustworthy source of information. And when they claim they can restart the Palisades nuclear plant, which is something no one has ever done, and they can do it for, you know, like a couple billion dollars, like I think they're estimating eight billion, uh, maybe they're lying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, t it would really cost like 20 billion and take 10 years. But um, it just, you know, throws into question whole text trustworthiness if their board members are under indictment for corruption. Oopsie. So, uh, next story, going back to our uh, initial story, basically the, the heat is killing people around the globe. Uh, this past couple weeks uh, saw people, lots of people dying. Over in Saudi Arabia was the greatest number. Uh, 1,081 were killed. Uh, these were pilgrims trying to go to the mm. Hajj. Oh. Yeah, and uh, the temperatures hit 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which was more than enough to kill a lot of people. Do you remember that awful thing when they had that fire in the 90s? No, I don't. Yeah, a bunch of people died in the fire. Oh, man. The Hajj. It was good. So, uh, yeah, the, over this is over 10 countries. There's, there's a... People go to the Hajj on this pilgrimage. Muslims are supposed to go visit the Hajj at least once in their life. And um, the problem is that if you re register, if you go officially, that costs extra money. So a lot of people go unofficially. And so Saudi Arabia provided air conditioning to the officially registered pilgrims, but there's hundreds of thousands of unregistered pilgrims, and those are the ones that got exposed to the heat, and over a thousand of them ended up dying. Uh, in Mexico, 125 people died. And uh, temperatures in Mexico hit 125.6 degrees, oh, which is... Oh, my God. Yeah, I can picture that. Yeah, a new record for Mexico. Um, and uh, so this was covered in an AP story. And one of the people in there said that this, they're experiencing... They've never experienced any heat this intense and pervasive in Mexico before. Uh, in India, the past couple weeks, uh, temperatures got up to 123, mm -hmm. which is pretty respectable in terms of killing heat. And 110 people have died with, interestingly, 40,000 uh, being hospitalized with heat stroke. So it's, it's getting hot, but we can't lose our cool and make bad decisions. Yeah. So uh, speaking of bad decisions, our, <laughs> our next story. <laughs> Uh, in, over in East Palestine, you may remember that uh, they decided to blow up the train cars because they thought they would explode, and then that turned out to be uh, absolutely wrong. They did not need to blow up the train cars and burn off all the vinyl chloride. Cleveland.com, June 20th, it turns out that the, the contamination from burning off the vinyl chloride uh, reached 16 states. Oh, uh, yeah, lovely. it was. Uh, 
they're talking about a study that was published in Environmental Research Letters, and uh, the chloride was detected uh, in Wisconsin to Maine and to North Carolina and all the states in between. This was discovered by the National Atmospheric Deposition Program, which is a program that was started back in the 70s to monitor acid rain. And they have 260 monitoring sites across the country. And uh, they found tons of sodium, which means, you know, that's from the, you know, sodium chloride and, the, you know, the vinyl chloride. They also expected to find a lot of hydrogen, but they didn't. They actually found less than usual because apparently the, the uh, some of the other chemicals reacted with that and took it out. Okay, but to finish and to end on an upbeat note, uh, last story, EU passes nature restoration law. Go EU. Yay. 20% of every country has to be uh, have its initial biodiversity restored by 2030, 60% by 2040, and 90% by 2050. Every, they have to change things from poor to good, and that means more birds. They're going to measure this by measuring birds and butterflies and carbon in the soil and uh, re-flooding peat bogs and basically just doing what we all need to do. So final story is a good decision done by the EU this past week. All right, thanks so much for listening. This is Joe Damar. And Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. I don't want no oil, a spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things, a creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun